<laughs> later to the night. Um, I want to welcome you to today's uh, opening plenary session. Um, today's uh, plenary will be uh, given by um, Sean Jacobs. He is an associate professor at the New School in New York City. He is also the founder of uh, Africa as a Country. I encourage you to look it up. It's a very interesting, very interesting uh, website. Um, Sean, can I please invite you up? Give it up, Sean. Okay, let's just have a little sip of water. Actually, I, I should be saying water, but uh, having been away from South Africa for so long while, I sometimes say water, water. And so I was, I was buying water in, uh, in Greenpoint someday, and the person I was buying it from said to me, that's five rand, and it's with a T. <laughs> okay, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. This is my first time at Wikimania. My relationship with Wikimania, apart from an abortive attempt to become a part of it is, uh, and to contribute to the encyclopedia, has been mainly as a user. One of apparently half a billion people that consult it every month. I want to commend you for your work. Of course, like most people, I consult English Wikipedia daily and for all kinds of topics and all kinds of debate. Most recently, during the World Cup, um, if you wanted to find out about the background of a player while you're watching a game and you wanted to learn more about him, you just kind of, you know, you Google. And then you'll, the first thing that will often come up is Wikipedia. Um, and you could look for their stats, you could look for their background, etc. Or when, when I wonder about the history of a song, or sometimes when I want to see the outlines of some, of some or other controversy in the news. Not always perfect, but as a starting point just to get me going. For Africa as a country, the site I founded and edited, Wikicommons, is quite useful when we look for images to illustrate posts as we're a non-profit publication with virtually no money. So let me, let me say something a little bit about how I come to, to, to this, like for what is the vantage point that I'm, that I'm coming to speak about Wiki, Wiki, the Wikimedia Foundation um, and Wikipedia. So I was born and grew up here in Cape Town on what is commonly referred to as the Cape Flats, where most of the city's black population lives. I went to university here, the University of Cape Town, and worked here briefly as a journalist and as a political researcher for a democracy think tank. While in between, I went to study first in the United States and then the United Kingdom. I now live and work in the United States. Like you, I care about and engage with the online world. As I mentioned before, my work on Africa as a country um, as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned before already, my work on, on Africa as a country, but to give you more context, nine years ago, I founded and have edited since then Africa as a country, a site of media criticism, analysis, and new writing. I started Africa as a country to respond to ahistorical, decontextualized portrayals and debates about Africa. This was mainly as somebody living as an immigrant um, in New York City, um, in, the, in, the, in the immediate years after the declaration of the war on terror by the United States. And I noticed how Africa as a country, my experience was seeing how Africa as a country went from the margins of, 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 of academia, journalism, and the literary world, where people used to scoff at, at writing on blogs or for blogs, to now where it's a standard practice for academics and journalists to cite and reference these kinds of writing or clamoring to write for sites like Africa as a country. And where universities, when it comes to promotions, are rewarding contributors to Africa as a country for their work on the site. And work, work on Africa as a country has also been nominated for prizes or used as part of a portfolio for an award or, an award or awards. Right now, one of our posts, Fear of a Black France, is helping to shape public debates about French political identity. This is the, the the one slide that I have up. And this article also, we've translated it also into French, so you can read it both um, in English and in French. If you haven't been following, this is the debate in, in which uh, people are trying to characterize this French team as an immigrant team, 
Um, uh, and then, because that's part of the way that the right in France would like to um, characterize them, and where other people are insisting that no, this is, this is a French team, and a French team with all its attendant history. For most of you, you probably encountered it through the spat between the French ambassador and the comedian, the South African comedian, Trevor Noah. It is especially fitting that you discuss the politics of knowledge, of archives, of history sources, of constructing and, and maintaining an online collaborative encyclopedia here in South Africa. My early life in South Africa was dominated by information deficits around race especially. South Africa was a racial dictatorship that did not take kindly to information. It operated via hierarchies and had an infrastructure in place that, pre that prevented people from communicating or learning new knowledge. A ministry of information, more like disinformation, a censorship board, and a state broadcaster that held a monopoly over radio and later television broadcast services, among others. Apartheid discouraged the collection of histories or archives of those it deemed subject peoples, that is, black people. It promoted the history of a, of a minority of whites. South African history, that is, a, the more complicated history, both of whites and blacks, the history of slaves, of the colonial past, and the apartheid present was written by mostly white men. Apartheid reinforced these rules and narratives by its media, its schools, universities, and other public institutions like churches. Of course, apartheid didn't have it all to themselves. In opposition, the people constructed their own histories. I remember Steve Biko's Black Consciousness Movement, which dominated resistance politics in the 1970s, or those attendant projects of the mass democratic movement in the 1980s, like People's History when I was in high school here in Cape Town, which, taught, which sought to tell the history of the oppressed. There were also South African versions of Samizdat publications, the so-called alternative press, which exposed the horrors of apartheid dead squads, dead, squads, dead squads, or the government and white South Africa's hypocrisies. And social movements opposing apartheid use resistance photography, poster art, song, and crucially oral histories to tell their stories. But it would be foolish to deny how pervasive apartheid's media information and knowledge order was. At the start of my final year of undergraduate studies, uh, sorry, the start of my final year of undergraduate studies at the University of Cape Town coincided with the beginning of the end of, the, of apartheid when the government unbanned liberation movements and released Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners from prison. No surprises that debates about knowledge or about what was deemed worthy of preserving or being recorded and who wrote history would come into full view. Much of this work of undoing the legacies of apartheid on education and knowledge production will focus on the curriculums in high school, especially history. Much of it also happened to be state-led, and that came with its own pitfalls. The ruling party was eager to, set, to tell history from its perspective. In this account, it and only it liberated South Africa, or South Africans. At the level of popular and public culture, a kind of middle ground politics framed the media coverage and shaped how people thought about the past and the present. Those were the things of the Rainbow Nation, of reconciliation and this whole notion of South Africans overcoming something. This kind of thinking did not encourage radical changes in South African politics. The political mood was reinforced by Mandela's persona or by Nelson Mandela's persona as conciliatory and his style of politics, which was consensus, as well as by public institutions like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which sought to bring to light apartheid human rights abuses but in effect served to award amnesty to most of apartheid's police, army, and dead squads. Not surprisingly, none of these institutions and political events resolved long-held resentments and uh, long-held resentments over the silences of apartheid, over what was left out, or over how South African histories were framed. Of course, like most places that are, in a, that are going to a transition, after a while, the country and its people had other things to worry about. Widespread corruption in the state, and any, ask any South Africa about the arms deal, 
the Guptas, Nkandla, or what South Africans call state capture. Just Google it if you don't find a South African to ask. Or ask South Africans about the state turning violently on its own people. Just Google Marikana. Or neglecting to take care of the vulnerable. In one instance, mental, mental health care patients died when the government outsourced their care. In another, it failed to pay pensions to millions of poor South Africans on time, basically these people's only income. More importantly, the majority of South Africans, basically black South Africans, could barely survive becoming poorer every year. Which is how, seemingly out of the blue, between March 2015 and December 2016, students at South, Africans, South Africa's university campuses, and I just want to say something here about uh, students uh, in South Africa. South Africa has roughly about nearly 50 million people um, and students make up no more than a million uh, people, which, is a, is, which in a way is kind of like an elite, if you want, um, but we can unpack that if we, if we need to. But students at African university campuses embarked on a series of protests that came to dominate South African politics and news. The demands included that university management not outsource workers, not raise tuition fees, or even better, scrap fees altogether. The slogans of these protests were, roads must fall in reference to a colonial figure um, who, was, who was very, uh, played a major role in the establishment of South African capital, capitalism, sorry, and fees must fall, which is self-explanatory. The students also demanded the end of patriarchy in political culture, with, in a political culture that is dominated by charismatic male leaders. But more than anything, the movement was animated by demands that racist colonial symbols, especially statues, on their campuses be removed. That, that a university named for a violent colonial figure, that same figure, Rhodes, be changed, and even more, that curriculums be reformed and more black professors be employed. In other words, they understood that for South Africa to change, its institutions needed to be radically altered. The target was white supremacy, what they refer to as white supremacy, reflected in institutions of higher learning, of knowledge production, and of the media. But the target was also the ruling African National Congress of Nelson Mandela, or the, the, the descendants of, because Nelson Mandela only governed South Africa for its first five years, whom the students judged harshly for the conditions black people lived under more than two decades after the end of apartheid. Since arriving here, you may have seen on Twitter references to Mandela being a, quote, sellout, unquote. That is, of course, an unfair characterization of Mandela, who retrospectively gets to be made a scapegoat for the, the, the subsequent failures of the people who came after him. Crucially, the version, the ANC's version of history was now being contested. The students called what they were demanding decolonization. Some among them rightly realized that decolonization would be hard intellectual work. It would also be unglamorous. To this end, they organized teachings, but more importantly, they began to share information online. They created these sort of like online libraries through the attachment of documents and films uh, audio files through Dropbox or Google Docs and to shape in real time how they wanted their struggle to be defined. On Twitter, Facebook, and crucially WhatsApp, these became crucial in how those participating in Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall made sense of themselves. There's a tweet sent out by student leaders at the University of Cape Town during the height of the Roads Must Fall that captures the engage, their engagement um, with social media. And in this tweet, they, they sort of say, uh, you know, this is very sort of South African language, comrades, Makaban, let's, let's charge our phones because it's our duty to, to write our own history. We, there's a way that we would like to be represented, so let's charge our phones. Make sure they charge tonight before you come back tomorrow. So they began to write to make a record of what they achieved and what still needed to be done. Now, as some of you know, particularly the South Africans here, by the end of 2016, the movement petered out. 
not long after they'd organized a mass march to the office of the president in the capital, Pretoria, or Chwane, who then announced a moratorium on fee increases at public universities. There are many reasons for why the movement stalled. Differences over strategy, differences over use of violence, including, you know, uh, going after blind ally, al uh, allies, but its impact has been lasting. Now, most South Africans understand the imperative of decolonization, whether they support or oppose it. Other legacies of the movement include that change is hard work, that you can't stand on the sidelines, that it will be messy, and that mistakes will be made, and that some people will lose in the process, and that you will have to, that some, and that some people will have to give up some of their power. And finally, that it won't be perfect and that that's fine too. Now what has this got to do with, you're like, hey, where is he going with this? What has this got to do with Wikipedia, Wikimedia Foundation, you're wondering? You're not a state, you're not apartheid, you're basically an organization of volunteers. But over the past few, very committed, committed volunteers, over the past few weeks, I have read accounts of the debates within the organization, and over the last three days, I've sat through, in one case, two days of one of the pre-conferences on decolonizing the internet. And I've watched as Wikipedians talk about what they think is missing, if Wikipedia wants to keep growing, or wants to continue to attract new converts, new editors, new, new users, etc. And, that, and I've also noticed that these debates have come a long way. One participant in one of the workshops I was at noted with exasperation to me that the debate about including oral citations is, is not new. So when somebody was like asking again about oral citations, he said, this is going on for a while, that most editors are male, are, are from the Northern Hemisphere, or was white, were white, or were white was another refrain. The same went for the majority of entries on English Wikipedia. New scientists cited a study that, quote, the snowy waste of Antarctica have more articles dedicated to them than all but one of the countries of Africa. In fact, many African nations have fewer articles than the fictional realm of, the, of Middle Earth. These regions are, quote, virtual terra incognita, noted the study. Other complaints are that you're failing to attract editors from the developing world to the big Wikipedias like English. This is all, you know, in this sort of being around here. There's also the controversial criteria of relevance and notability and who defines those. And that as a result, large parts of human knowledge remain absent from Wikipedia as a result. Other people said that this state of affairs would require a serious rethink of the way knowledge is compiled. And finally, that quote, Wikipedia is a publisher, this I read somewhere on the internet, but is deeply suspicious of the internet, unquote. And it is not that, that the people in Wikimedia or, Wiki, or, or Wikipedia haven't pushed for any change. Um, and, and you know, when I say this, I, I, I say this because I think you're all committed, this is your organization, you want it to work. I, I, I also hear this when I meet people, there's a kind of excitement around the project, still. And one of the examples that I, that I, was, that I read about was the oral citation project, and I, I watched a video called um, People and Knowledge. So clearly there's been, and, and this project I think was, was, was uh, supported by the, um, um, the Wikimedia Foundation, so clearly there's been work. In fact, about that project, um, the New York Times reported that the film spends time showing what has been lost to Wikipedia because of stickling rules, what they call stickling rules of citation um, uh, and verification, and that it also noted that some of the non-English Wikipedia are already far ahead of the, of the more influential English Wikipedia in terms of citing um, oral evidence via videos, interviews, to document traditions and cultures that don't necessarily have written sources to back up claims um, and, as, and challenging uh, Wikipedia's uh, uh, rule of no original research. 
Yet it seems that there's been little movement on many of these things since, you know, given that these debates um, have been going on for long. And as and I've mentioned the New York Times already, which is that outsiders um, um, are also noticing. In 2011, the New York Times reported that, quote, Wikipedia has been criticized from without and within for reflecting a Western male-dominated mindset similar to the perspective behind encyclopedias that it has replaced, which is quite a damning thing to say about you know, a project. So I wanna, I wanna pause and look elsewhere, um, and I wanna, I wanna go back to sort of the place that I know better, which is the academy, and particularly um, look at, look at um, what historians have done, and how historians, and maybe through that we can, we can, this could hopefully be helpful to some of your debates. Um, so how historians have worked through and are working through difficult debates about the internet as a source archive, about the usability of websites and of oral citations, um, and perhaps, as I said, this could be helpful for some of the debates that you have, you, you're having. Now, journalism has been described as the first rough draft of history. Like, this is sort of a cliche even nowadays. Increasingly, however, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and blogs, among others, have taken on the role in documenting social um, and political life. This includes live reporting via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, real-time conversations known as number tweets, threads, or Twitter essays, etc. And many journalists, under pressure to produce immediate copy in the fast news cycle, increasingly draw on such sources um, draw, draw, draw on such sources for eyewitness account of, of what's, you know, breaking news. I know that CNN, CNN has turned breaking news into some kind of cliche, but, you know, it does exist. And it's not unusual to see news stories sourced entirely, you know, using sources from social media. This is particularly the case when media outlets may have difficulty reaching affected areas or lack contacts among affected groups as in the cases of natural disasters, armed conflicts, social movements, or humanitarian crises, uh, for example, the, the global refugee crisis. In addition, a wide range of people are themselves creating archives, sometimes shaping the work of information professionals, um, as with journalists, or bypassing them entirely. The result may be that the first draft of history is now being prepared on social media. And historians are catching on to the potential of the internet as a source and as an archive of contemporary politics or of contemporary social life. The internet has also dem democratized access to the past beyond traditional media and political elites or social classes, both in terms of people's ability to gain access to media, but also to participate and contribute in the public sphere as well as tell narratives about the past. When King's College in London unveiled the digitized archive of South African cleric and activist Desmond Tutu's speeches, letters, writings, and other materials in 2006, the historian William Bynard, one of the advisors on the project, noted optimistically to a journalist that, quote, the great advantage of an unedited archive is the opportunity it gives to take a fresh look at the man without the biographer looking over your shoulder to make sure you read you reach the right conclusion, conclusions, unquote. And usually trawling an archive means office hours in a strange city, so only the professionals get a look. An online archive will mean that everyone can consult it. A large chunk of contemporary archives, including much of the latter part of Tutu's life, for example, including his time as chairman or chairperson of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, are, na are natively digital, i.e. it's online already. And to a large extent, they don't need to be di digitized. In addition, with social media, hashtags and date stamped content mean that users are doing some of the archivist work for historians and for reference scholars. Increasingly, libraries and archives have embraced the potential of the internet to reach wider audiences with access only limited by internet speed and by having a connection in the first place 
And one major consequence is that the physical constraint of cell space and site capacity fall away. One of the first public research and archival institutions to catch on to the potential pre presented by social media and the internet as an archive um, was the US Library of Congress. Already in 2000, the library began collecting materials from congressional and presidential campaign websites, legal blogs, websites of candidates for national offices, for national office, and websites of members of Congress. Then, and this, is, this was uh, quite revolutionary at the time, in 2010, Twitter announced that it would donate to the library its digital archive of public tweets from, from its inception in 2006. And at that point, the tweets already numbered in the billions. At the time, the then Library of Congress, the then Librarian of Congress, James Billington, captured the significance of the donation. And I quote, the Twitter digital archive has extraordinary potential for research into our contemporary way of life. This information provides detailed evidence about how technology-based social networks form and evolve over time. The collection also documents a remarkable range of, of, of social trends. Anyone who wants to understand how an ever-broadening public is using social media to engage in an ongoing debate regarding social and cultural issues will have need of this material." Unquote. However, despite the increasing use of social media and the internet as archive, debates among historians over its value as a source um, is a relatively recent development. Some historians are optimistic and excited by the potential as a record of history as it happens. And I quote one of them, much of our modern history from the Arab Spring to protest to civil unrest and elections are tweeted away by hundreds of thousands of millions of users with their smartphones. Among this group, there is an optimism that is, quote, logical to assume that future historians will also look at these sources. Historians could utilize social media and the internet in re to research things as the first people who reported live from what later became known as the Arab Spring, or what Barack Obama, or even more, even more intensely, Donald Trump, says on Twitter during an election campaign, or how people reacted to it in, in their social media um, uh, conversations. Of course, not everyone is happy about the internet as source. Critics cite, among others, problems with data preservation, questions about reliability, the politics of archiving, and access to the internet. Links to sites go dead, sites go down, and URLs change. Other factors include sources being either shut down, migrated to another domain, or archived and requiring special permission uh, to access. Information about events such as the Egyptian Revolution of 2011 or the Syrian Civil War is lost. It is interesting to quote one of the reasons why some librarians, archives, and history museums were collectively wary of the new direction. One major, direct, one major reason was that social media would, would undermine the authority of, of, of museums. And one of them was that this trend of users creating and contributing to the content can be rightfully alarming to institutions seen, to be seen by their constituents as a voice of authority, like history museums. It seems antithetical to the concepts of museums as bastions of expertise and scholarship. However, these research organizations and academic peer groups have no choice but to engage more online. And evidence suggests the benefits of online, um, uh, online engagement outweigh such concerns. In the case of museums, the internet has proven to enhance the experience of visitors as well as those ex accessing an archive or collection online. For example, a virtual exhibition can incorporate different media allowing the exhibition development team to rethink the exhibition without the confines of space, security, and conservation limitations. It's useful to look closely at the experience of African historians with online uh, resources. In early 2000, a group of African historians met at the University of Texas at Austin to discuss sources and methods in African history. The result was a 2003 book summarizing the debates and issues of the conference. Looking back, it is remarkable that the book does not contain any mention of online source, uh, source material. 
Nevertheless, some African historians have been thinking about the possibilities for research represented by the internet at, at that time. In 2002, the now late Stephen Ellis, a prominent historian of Liberia, noted that accounts of events authored contemporaneously or near contemporaneously by Africans and which is then published on the internet is, quote, one major source of African-generated documentation that is available to historians of recent decades in Africa, providing some sort of corrective to the bias of external sources, but exists only rarely for those researching the distant African past. It's telling, however, that nearly a decade after the University of Texas conference, the 2013 Oxford Handbook of Modern African History's entry on communications and media in African history only mentioned the internet and social media briefly towards the end of the essay after dealing at length with film, radio, and television as archives. On the plus side, the handbook concluded that historians were showing an appetite to research electronic media and have found that rich documentary and oral evidence survives, offering multiple parts to study. Since then, historians have been more open to the possibilities presented by social media archives, especially in developing countries. The internet provides the avenue for scholars to search for resources without having to excessively rely on the under-equipped libraries mostly seen in developing countries. For example, in a recent book-length study of Barack Obama's relationship with his late father's home, Kenya, the historians Matthew, Kare, um, I'm gonna have to say his name slowly, Kare Tonuto and Catherine Luongo noted that social media provided sources and spaces for challenging misrepresentations of Kenya's past and present and was an increasingly important space for debating local politics. YouTube can also be val valuable. The historian Terva Getz, in his book, A Primer for Teaching African History, writes about how social media like YouTube often provide access to African-produced material. Some videos provide interesting ways to com complicate or be bring into question key narratives. For example, YouTube videos of Ugandan views on the Kony 2012 campaign, I don't know if you remember that, can be useful to think about that series of events. Historical pieces from African television channels and music videos can also be quite helpful. Getz points to the value of comments posted below YouTube videos to understand contemporary debates over historical events or, or um, a historical event or events. In closing, it is worth noting a number of projects originating on the African continent since we are here that point to interesting possibilities for how we engage with social media and online archives and which point to interesting possibilities for historians and researchers' relationships to online archives. One of the most fascinating examples um, is that over identity. The historian Liz Timms has written about online Zulu identities in South Africa. She has argued that the internet stands as the next generation of, pet, of print capitalism, a forum for the expression of and shared understanding of, her com of a community. In her work, Timms outlines how Zulu identities are not fixed in either the analog or digital world. Given that Zulu ethnic identity is no longer confined to the analog world, historians must take heed of its presence in the digital realm in order to keep up with how it's shifting and changing. She argued, for example, and I quote, that there is, no, there is an imagined digital Zulu community, many of them in fact, and given this reality, historians must realize that contemporary Zulu identity this course is inherently wrapped up in the digital, necessi necessitating a shift in perspective for historians hoping to chart um, the contemporary manifestations of this centuries old debate. The most interesting Zulu language debate is occurring not in educational forums, but rather on social media. Zulu speakers on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are adapting these forums to their own needs far beyond any level of custodianship. Though it's easy to overstate the democratizing effect of the internet, especially given the disparities in access to both connectivity and technology in KwaZulu-Natal and South Africa as a whole, there is no doubt that the digital realm has, has opened new spaces for debates over Zuluness to 
to a broader constituency than had previously det determined both the direction and content of those contestations. Historians must take these shifts into consideration in their understanding of the contemporary imaginary, imagined community of, of Zulus in the analog and digital realms. Um, I'm gonna jump over something here which is about another project but I can recommend that people uh, Google it. It's, no, it's a project also out of uh, um, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa called the Owazi Project. Um, this is a project funded by the uh, Durban City Council and the public libraries there and it encourages um, the recording of, of using oral interviews, using social media to construct um, local history uh, in that city, uh, uh, Ulwazi, U-L-W-A-Z or Z-I. Another archive that I can sort of briefly mention e and held up, that is held up as exemplary, uh, is the Digital Bleak and Lloyd Archive. This is an archive that was digitized by the University of Cape Town Center for Curating the Archive. I would recommend looking at that place, the Center for Curating the Archive. And this archive includes a 280,000 word searchable index, cross-referenced and including notes and summaries um, for uh, a, a series of art from the 19th century produced in Cape Town by two um, researchers, two white researchers at the time, and 20, um, 20 odd uh, San prisoners who were held at the Breakwater Lodge, which is not far from here, um, and this, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a colonial archive, but the fact that it's now available online, readily available online, means that people um, can research it. Finally, there is the South African History Online, or uh, SAHO, which was founded in 2000 by Omar Bacha, a former trade unionist and documentary photographer, and describes itself as a, quote, nonpartisan people's history institution created to address the biased way in which South African history and heritage, as well as the history and heritage of Africa is represented in our educational and cultural institutions, unquote. Bacha works with a small team. Um, however, the project's impact far outweighs its size. It's used in many schools. Um, history and history teachers, and history teaching is contested in South Africa, and South African History Online broadens out what South Africans or those interested in South Africa learn about the country's history. The bias on, on South African history online is towards liberation history and, and resistance history. It features text, audio, video, and primary documents. It's also easy to navigate, and its search function works really well. Um, and it, it's not you know, as deep as uh, Wikipedia, but it has that same kind of the way that it's unpacked South Africa in terms of its depth and reach. Um, so let me com com con conclude, and I want to pivot back to Africa as a country. For me, one of Africa as a country's greatest achievements is that knowledge can be produced outside of the academy and elite institutions and can make a useful contribution to our understanding of contemporary politics. Now that Africa as a country's work is accepted as valid, it has elevated different ways of seeing the world and brought into mainstream discourse knowledge by a diversity of authors that weren't there before. It will continue to do so, hopefully far into the future. And if I may toot our own horn a bit, the historian Trevor Getz, who I mentioned earlier in his new book on a primer to teach African history, which was published by Duke University Press, includes this piece of advice for his colleagues, and I quote, Africa is a country, is the first place I suggest students, students turn to when they want to understand some events in the news from beyond the accepted media nar uh, narratives, unquote. The challenge then for Wikipedians may be to stop debating and act, to catch up with the future, to shelve the debates, because I hear this a lot, we're debating, we're debating, and get to action. This is if you are serious about wanting to, grow, to keep growing and wanting to be true to your founding of revolutionizing, um, as, as, uh, to be true to your founding, which, is a, which was a then revolutionary act in publishing and in knowledge production. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sean. We have five minutes and not a minute more uh, for questions and comments. Um, I think it gives us enough time for, for one, and I'll see how much time we have left after that one. Any questions or comments for Sean? Please, you can cut. There are speakers on either side of the, the, hall, the, the walkways here. Nope. Great. Then I think we can, then I think we can uh, break for the, uh, we can break for the rest of the day until uh, the last session um, of the day that'll be here at five o'clock. See you guys then. Oh, um, before you guys get up, I just want to ask if everyone can leave the room. Um, the uh, hotel staff are going to need to uh, pack up some chairs and divide the room into two. So we're going to need everyone to leave the room. Thank you so much.